Okay, we're recording. Um, okay, so what I thought I'd, I'd talk about today is uh, these three topics are sort of the focus is on continuous learning. Um, but and we'll look at kind of several papers. So we're not going to go through each one in any uh, detail, but there's some underlying concepts in each one which are which are quite interesting and, and relevant. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of spend a couple of slides on each one. Um, but the uh, papers would be sort of MAML, which we already talked about. Uh, that's kind of a background. Um, and MAML is used in the OML paper and the animal paper. Um, and if you remember, there's a variant of MAML called reptile. So there's like whole animal naming theme going on here. Um, and then also uh, this new paper on something called supermass and superposition. Um, so we'll talk about uh, a bunch of those. Um, so before we, we do that, I thought I'd just sort of review a little bit about continuous learning in HTMs and, and temporal memory. I'm not going to go into in de this in detail, but the way we often talk about how inference works in HTMs and how continuous learning works is using a particular type of language. So we, you know, we talk about mini columns and cells. So here's a cell A. I mean, an input coming in A, and it activates a number of mini columns. And without any context, all the mini columns uh, become active. Um, these then cause predictions and uh, specific cells and other mini columns. Um, and as kind of shown on the right figure here, the way this prediction happens is that you have connections from some of these cells in these active mini columns onto one dendrite. On, on this red cell and another dendrite on this red cell and so on. And so when this red cell detects a pattern on one of its dendrites, it becomes depolarized or predicted state. So that's what's showed in these kind of red dots. Um, and so this, if these correspond to the B mini column, then we say kind of B is predicted. And then when B actually comes in, this cell, because it was depolarized, will win and the, the rest of the cells in this mini column uh, won't become active. Let me just turn on the one right here. Okay. Um, and if there was a mistake, if, if there wasn't a, a correct prediction here, um, so if these cells were not depolarized, then all of these cells would become active. We'd pick a winner cell, and then we'd learn the previous pattern on a specific dendrite on those cells. Okay, so these dendrites bias these cells to win, and if there's no winner, then we pick a random one and learn uh, patterns on that. So this is kind of the language we typically use to describe it. Um, I'm gonna say, show a uh, slightly different way of showing the exact same thing. So one thing to note is that after learning, in reality, this network is very densely recurrently connected, and we never really show this in our pictures, I realize. But there's a, you know, once we've learned a whole bunch of sequences, there's tons of connections going back and forth between these cells. Um, so it's a very uh, densely connected recurrent network, right? Um, what's kind of going on is that when you're showing a particular task or a sequence, um, you're instantiating a very, very sparse subnetwork that's embedded in this densely recur recurrent network. Right, that's the connected recurrent network. Um, so again, this we don't typically talk about it this way, but um, what's happening is that these dendrites are actually choosing which subnetwork to instantiate at any given point. Right. So if you think about this being a full, really densely connected network for a particular sequence, uh, you, you know, you instantiate a particular subset, which is like this guy, this guy, this guy connected to a previous set of cells there. That's for this one transition in this one sequence. Uh, and the specific dendrites that become active by biasing the cell and determining who wins, they're actually instantiating this particular subnetwork. Okay, so that's in some ways what a dendrite is doing. It's, it's choosing a subnetwork. Uh, of course, we have very sparse distributed representations. So that avoid significant overlap between the tasks. So even if a few of these cells might overlap uh, with other, other tasks or a few of these you know, portions of the subnetwork, the network, subnetwork as a whole represented by an SDR uh, 
because it's super sparse, it avoids significant overlap between tasks. And that's how you can kind of learn new things and instantiate uh, new things without sort of getting confused uh, with other stuff. And then, uh, you know, we talk about the weights being binary and permanences essentially choose which weights to make active for a particular task or a sequence via learning. Um, and Marcus has kind of drawn this connection in the past before with his variational uh, inference and variational dropout stuff. And so, uh, you know, permanences during learning choose which subnetworks to make, uh, choose which subnetwork is going to be part of a particular sequence uh, or a task. Okay, so this is kind of background. I'm just saying the exact same. This is no change in temporal memory. Just, I'm just explaining it in a slightly different language. Um, and you'll see the point of this uh, as I describe uh, some of these papers. Uh, any questions on, on that? Is that was that all? Is this already all obvious to people, or uh, is this anything new? Uh, just a quick question. Um, when you said that it mispredicts and it chooses one at random to try to learn, uh, is it truly random, or do the permanences somehow work into it? Um, it's it's in our algorithm. It's it's pretty random. In 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 the neocortex, it might not be truly random. There might be still a little bit of each cell is not going to be exactly have the same amount of depolarization. There'll be some randomness in there. Um, you know, so, something will will choose it. But in our algorithm, it's it's completely random. And it's actually good that it's random. Um, that that gives you kind of the big the full. You can use the full representational space that way. Okay. Okay. So uh, here are the papers, various papers that that I'll focus on now. Um, and I think this is, they all sort of came out in rapid succession or over the last 12 months, sort of. Um, and it's sort of a fascinating constellation of papers and continuous learning. Um, and what I'll do is uh, I'll go through it in this sequence. So I'll first talk about this one, which is the OML paper. Um, and then I'll do the animal paper, which is down here. Um, uh, then as a third one, I'll talk about the super masks uh, and superposition. Uh, mammal, I'll just briefly show my drawings from when we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, but mammal is used in OML and animal. So it might be useful just to kind of remember what, what it is. Um, but the core is kind of these three papers. We'll talk about. Okay, so this is a review of uh, my whiteboard drawings of, of mammal. Um, so mammal is a meta learning technique. And if you remember the goal is to discover a network that a set of weights that is going to be already good at many of a particular uh, set of tasks. Okay. Uh, in, in the original mammal paper, uh, uh, they described good as being how quickly you can learn each task. Um, but the idea is that through this meta learning process, um, you're going to find some optimal set of weights, which is basically like an initialization for the network. And from that set of weights, it's going to be primed to be really good at this, this big task that you've, you've defined. Um, and the basic uh, you know, terminology and, and loop was um, there's a, a network with weights theta. Um, and that's the kind of network you're trying to optimize. So you initialize with some random uh, values for theta, and then you go through this loop where you pick a task out of your collection of, of tasks, uh, and then for each task, you perform the task. Uh, in her case, it was training on, on k samples, and then you, what you do is for each task, you're going to get a different weight, a uh, different network, which is this theta updated by the, the gradient steps for that task, and then what you do is you update this original theta um, to minimize the loss on each of these individual networks here um, using a test set. Okay, so and then you kind of, you so now you've changed the initialization of this network uh, based on how well it's doing on, on all of these uh, different tasks. And so then you repeat and hopefully over time, you're gonna find a set of networks that is going to do very well on all of these different tasks. And as in, in the meta learning case, during the meta test testing, <laughs> they 
they they uh, test this on a completely new set of tasks that have not been seen during training as well, but they're all kind of part of the same thing. Um, okay, so you can imagine uh, you can so what the OML paper does is apply this basic framework to continuous learning instead of looking at how fast it learns, uh, they're going to look at how well it remembers previous categories. Okay, so this is the OML paper um, by Javed et al. Um, and what they do is um, they set up a set of a, a network like this. So you have an input coming in. Um, you have what's called a representation learning network, which is you know, several layers here. Um, the output of that is then fed to another network called the prediction learning network. And what happens is that during the meta learning phase, um, you up these, this is the theta. You're going to update, you're going to learn the weights uh, for this network, for the representation learning network. Uh, and during the continuous learning portion, you're just going to adapt the weights on the prediction learning network to see how well it for each successive task. Okay, so the idea is to learn a, a network here that outputs representations that are going to be really good for continuous learning. Okay. So the, the training loop that they have is very similar to the mammal thing. Uh, so here, um, instead of a task where you're going to learn things quickly, what you learn is uh, what you sample is a continuous learning task. Um, and so the way they define this, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll explain this in a, in a second. So you sample a particular continuous learning task where you're gonna learn multiple categories in a row. And then for each continuous learning task, you're gonna go through this sequence of categories, uh, train it on, on each one, um, and then compute a loss. So here, uh, they, they look at mainly Omniglot, that's their, their main result, which is this um, data set. I forget how many, I think it's like 1,600 different categories or something like that. So they choose, randomly choose, so they, they first uh, have a subset of all the categories as their training subset. And then there's another subset, which is the test subset, which is not seen during training at all. So what happens during training is they choose uh, randomly some list of 200 of those training classes. Okay, so these are 200 Omniglot classes. Then they train on five examples from each of these 200 classes. So that's going to be a thousand examples in a row. Okay, so five from class one, five from class two, five from class three, and so on. Um, and these are trained in sequence in a continuous learning uh, setup. So it's like a 200 head task. Um, and then this loss function looks at the test set, test examples from these 200 classes, computes the accuracy over all 200 of these classes, and uh, that becomes their loss function. And then they update the, the theta so that the loss, you, you want to minimize the loss on all of these classes. Okay, so this inner loop is a, the standard continuous learning uh, thing that, that that's being like where you have a set of tasks and you learn each task in a row. Um, and then you want to see how well you've learned all of the classes at the end of the day. And then that becomes the inner loop for this whole meta learning uh, set. In reality, uh, if they were to actually do this, this would be a thousand steps. And um, you'd have to accumulate these gradients over a thousand steps. So what they do is they only update five of these at a time. So they pick you know, some random point in the sequence train, uh, I'm sorry, they did five classes at a time. So they pick a random point within this list of 200 classes. They train for the next five classes then they update the weights and they, they iterate. So they don't do a full thousand in here. Um, Okay, any questions? And then, so going back to here, uh, the con continuous learning piece is they freeze these weights, and then this becomes a 200 head continuous learning problem, and they learn 200 categories in sequence. They see how well they do. They take that error and then they back propagate it uh, 
into theta, update theta. Uh, so that'll be the next iteration. Then they keep this weight, this network fixed again, and then they uh, train this guy for continuous learning. Um, so this, this this works really well. Um, so they're able to, they show learning 200, what it looks like learning 200 categories at a time. Um, and OML uh, does quite well and it remembers at the end of the day, it gets about 63% accuracy across all 200 classes, which in a continuous learning setup is, um, is really impressive. Um, some of these, I don't remember what all of these, I think pre-training is if you were to train uh, the network completely on some of the class, uh, on the 200, the training set of the 200 classes, and then try to do continuous learning, it, it doesn't work very well. Um, but OML performs uh, quite well uh, in here. Uh, so this is, it's quite impressive to be able to learn 200 categories in a row like this. Um, and the uh, one big point they make in this uh, in this paper is that by doing this, the representation that they learn is super sparse. Um, so that that's kind of uh, nice. That um, if you look at you know any particular output, any any particular point in the uh, in the scheme after the whole meta learning phase is is. Uh, learned. If you look at the output of the representation network, it's extremely sparse. Um, and the other thing to mention is, if you look at the average activation across all of the all the classes, um, you know, the, it's it's fairly high. Meaning all of the units are actually used quite well. And in our spatial pooler, this is what we try to get to with with boosting as well. Um, but how do they get this level of sparsity even though they don't uh, explicitly uh, uh, encourage it? Yeah, they don't encourage it. What All they're trying to do is do well on continuous learning. Um, and so the meta learning process must have picked weights in such a way in the, in the data, in the representation network, uh, such that you always get very sparse outputs. So just naturally exactly so what yeah go ahead so it's just naturally learning these sub networks for each of the different tasks that it has to do well they don't so that it's not clear what it's doing they i don't think they really analyze the weights um i imagine uh it may have learned a very sparse set of weights um, um it could have just uh, learned weights such that they're still using relu they're not using k win or k call or anything like that Right, so they might have learned uh, weights such that the average dot product is very close to zero. Um, and you know, for specific types of inputs, only some of them actually get above zero and, and some don't. It, it's not clear to me exactly what, what, they're not explicit, like I say, it, it's not explicitly designed to be a sparse network, but the meta learning process learned that um, sparsity is best for this continuous learning setup. Okay, so that's OML. Um, Animal uh, tries to take the, and they, they sort of, uh, they, they say that work is built on top of OML. Um, it's the exact same kind of training setup and stuff like that, uh, but their network architecture is different. Um, so what they do is they add a neuromodulatory network, this theta NM, which gets the input, and then they have the basic prediction network, which also gets the input. Um, and what's going on here is the output of the of this blue network, the neuromodulatory network. That output eventually has the exact same number of units here as the number of units uh, as the vector coming out of out of here. And then they do element-wise multiplication. Okay, and so this modulatory network is sort of gating the outputs to the classifier, gating the activity that eventually gets to the classifier. So the way I kind of think of it is this network is kind of learning which activations are important for a given input. It's trying to pick some characteristics of this input and saying, oh, based on this characteristics, specific 
output units are gonna be more important than others. You know, so it's, it's, it's kind of like an attention system. It's, it's gating uh, the outputs here. The, so during meta learning, they learn all of these weights. Uh, the weird thing is that during continuous learning, only these, only the classifier weights are updated. So during the meta learning phase, all of these weights are updated, but when it's doing continuous learning, so it's learning class, you know, K and then K plus one and K plus two and so on, only the heads are updated. Um, I was not very satisfied with this. It's like, I, I thought, is this really continuous learning in that case? Um, is it really, well, it is continuous learning, but is it really solving the catastrophic forgetting problem? Um, because during continuous learning, all of these weights are fixed. Um, so I was kind of left slightly unsatisfied with that. I would have been happier if at least some part of this basic network was also updated. Um, so in OML, remember, um, you know, in their prediction learning network, they had several layers there that were fully updated and only the kind of the base representation was fixed. Um, so, so what do you think is happening to less layers? Just memorizing everything? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when it's learning class K, only the head for class K is being updated. Uh, maybe, um, I don't remember if they're learning a couple of categories at a time or if they're just learning one category at a time. And I think it's just essentially, um, like like you're saying, memorizing which which activations it should, it should attach to that head, right? Um, so this guy is doing a lot of the work. Um, in figuring out which activation should be actually sent to the classifier, but the continuous learning piece is very minimal. So it was, I, I thought this was a little odd and, and not fully satis, uh, satisfying as a continuous learning system or solving the catastrophic problem, forgetting problem. Um, they get, but they get really good results. So here's, um, they go up to 600 categories in a row. Um, instead of 200. And you can see that uh, the animal uh, during testing time, it retains something like 63% accuracy on all 600 classes that were that it was trained on. So just as a reminder, again, during the meta training, it's trained on you know, hundreds of classes where each time it, it does continuous learning on some subset of these classes. Once meta learning is finished, they don't change those weights at all, they get a completely new set of classes, and now you learn 600 of them in a row. Okay, so it says never seen those classes during training. Okay, so it is, the, you know, it's a completely new set of classes, but, and it's able to learn 600 of them in a row, where learning involves just learning the output weights. Um, so one, so this is quite impressive that they were able to learn 600 classes. One kind of really interesting twist to all this that I just learned recently, I was in touch with uh, Kuram Javed who did the OML. So they, he just found a PyTorch bug in his scripts. As we know, writing these continuous learning things in PyTorch is really tricky. I think he didn't accumulate the gradients quite correctly. And so he just found a budget bug in his scripts. And after he fixed the bug, if he puts a single output layer, so to mimics the OML and the animal setup, uh, he gets the same results as animal. So what I mean by that is, uh, if you go back to this thing, in this prediction layer network, if he just has a classifier and, and nothing else in between, no hidden layers, just this representation and this classifier. And so it's again, just learning the classifier weights. Um, he ends up getting the same results as animal. So in his case, he does not have a neuromodulatory network. Uh, so I thought that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, so there's now two different ways of getting this basic result here, uh, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, with animal, they also looked at the outputs here. They're looking, um, uh, at the outputs after the gating here, before and after the gating. And what they see is that after the the gating, the outputs are super sparse again. So in their case also, the classifier is seeing extremely sparse activations coming in. So this is like the output of the, of the basic network. This is like the output of the, 
gating signal. And wherever there's a coincidence between those two, that's presumably where there's a activation coming in. Copy coming in. Okay, so they also make a point of noting that this thing becomes super sparse. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, I, I ask a question on Slack about Animo using a remember set. I don't know if I had a chance of saying that. Um, could, could you remind me what that remember set was? Uh, yeah, uh, the arg algorithm for Animo, at each update, they have like a remember set, which is a small set of 64 samples, uh, sample from all previous tests that they use in the update. And that makes it very different from OML because that means they have some sort of replay. Well, I, you don't see that in OML. Oh, you, okay. Can you um, go to the, the algorithm there? Or just uh, comment oh, which, that. Wh where was that in the, uh, let's Look see. for a remember set. There you go. And, and you can see that in the algorithm, you, you can also see that. That small part there, just train plus a random sample 64 instance from the set of all meta training classes. So that's- Oh, uh, okay. So there's a little bit of replay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Um, it's been a while since I read this paper. Um, and so that could, um, you so can there, yeah, yeah, line. so there, yeah, 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 exactly. There is a SRAM, that's the replace that. Uh, this one, right? Yeah. Line four, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah so, um, so they're training on this new trajectory as well as some subset of the previous ones. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a little weird, that's interesting. Um, uh, that, you know, that, that means, you know, they must have put that in because they needed it. Right. Exactly. Right? Presumably without it, it, it didn't do as well. Did they have a graph showing it without the remember set? No, the, the, there isn't. Okay. I wonder how, uh, so that makes the OML one even more impressive because they don't have that. And now they're getting the same result as animal. Yeah, but the, the strange thing is that when they talk about the remember set, they cite the OML paper and say they are using the same scheme. So I, I was wondering if I read an outdated version of the OML paper, but... I don't I, remember seeing that in the OML paper. It is not. I, I, I read it again. I, I didn't find anything. It, it's weird. It's two different uh, ways of citing the test. And of course, if you put the remember set in the OML, it could be even better, right? No, what what I what I do remember is um, <laughs> remember um, is that in OML what they do is instead of training on all thousand things in a row, they just pick five classes at a time and just train on you know five or four instances of each class at a time. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's what they're calling the remember set. Is that possible or? Uh... Yeah, it's, it's not it's not quite what it says here. Yeah, it's it's not the same thing, but I see what you meant. Yeah. And that was just a optimization issue. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. sorry, these are so big I was taking screenshots. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point that out that yeah, there's no there's no the word remember doesn't appear in here. Um and and where does he say it's that's what's going on in OML? Uh, just if you comment that, remember again. Some the first time he mentioned, I think there is a. Oh, there. The, so there's the remember set, but then he says the meta loss function is remember is referred to as the OML thing. So that's just the how you compute the loss. Uh, but can you Google again? Remember, is there another Google? <laughs> you mean like Google. search? <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time they talk about the remember set, they cite this. Oh, okay. 
there. Yeah, I don't think they cite directly then. Oh, this is this is maybe for the just for computing the loss. Right, but if you're using for computing the loss, then it's affecting your optimization, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so it's not like they're it's not quite the same as um, uh, as a replay. They're not training on it then. Well, they are. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. If you look at algorithm one line nine, where you calculate the gradient there. S yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, that's right. That's right. Uh, well, okay. So it's not in the inner loop. It's not in the continuous learning piece of it. It's used to compute the, it's, it's used as the meta learning objective. Yeah, yeah. It's in the outer loop. Uh, so it, it's, it's slightly different from replay, but it's, it is being, that information is being used. So maybe that's what, this this thing is here. So this is the OML one. They have two different. Yeah, sorry, I can take this offline. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. an important. It's an important point. Um, I mean, it's it's not a big deal. Yeah. It was just no, uh, well, it's it's it's. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, we can we can uh, uh, look at. I, you know, I didn't go into so much detail into into each one. I don't know, uh, Karan, if you had a chance to look through that at all. If you remember any of that, uh, the, the the remember set. Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't even. I think I totally missed that detail. Yeah. Yeah. It's a. So in in what what you're saying is in computing the meta learning loss function. Uh, they're incorporating a few random examples from, so they might learn on sort of five classes in sequence, but they're also including um, some, so that of course they're going to test on those, but uh, I'm sorry, they're going to compute the meta loss on those, but they're also using some other previously learned classes from the full set of 200 or 600. Yeah. In there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a good point. Any other questions on any of this? You said the the bug he had was that uh, he he was zeroing out the gradient each time. Was that it? Um, so he d he didn't say exactly what the bug was. Um, in, in at least, hold on. Here's a GitHub. You just said, fixed a bug that resulted in incorrect meta gradients. These meta gradients uh, involve taking a second derivative, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, in here, probably in PyTorch, um, and then he says significantly improved results on both Omniglot and his sign benchmark using a linear PLN layer, as suggested by. This is the animal paper here it's possible to get the same results as animal without using any neuromodulation layers. So overall, all of his results are improved and in particular, in this particular case, they can mimic animal. Uh, next thing is the, this repository is, is active and uh, he's sort of still constantly making changes on it. I think this is his master thesis. So he's still working on that. Oh, I had a. Uh, well, I guess there's a there's a whole discussion here which I didn't really look at. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, I, I had one more comment when you talk about uh, no. freezing. Yeah. So, uh, you you said it's a bit disappointing, but it, it's not that different from uh, animal from OML because in OML. Uh, theta is the convolutional part, that's the four first layers. And then W is this, the fully connected, the, the last two. So yeah, the convolutional layers are also uh, frozen there during the inner loop and they're updated in the outer loop. 
And what they did in Animal, in order to keep the network the same size, they had the four convolution and then two FC, and they broke into two networks. So the, the, the NM network has two conv and one fully connected, and the prediction network has two conv and fully connected. So what they do is they freeze the conv and only train the fully connected. But that's the same thing they do in OML. The only difference that in OML, they only have, they have two fully connected, and then they train those two, while in Animo they have one fully connected, so they only train that one. But it's yeah, same. yeah. I, the the disappointing part to me, uh, yeah. So I, I I totally agree with everything you said. Uh, the disappointing part to me is that to me, this is just a classifier. Um, yes, it's a it's a it's a it's a linear connected network, but this all you know, you're just training a subset of the classifier here. You you here you're doing multi head training, right? Right. And so you pick, you know what task it is. You're only updating those weights. Um, and the hard work is all done during meta learning. Um, and the, the continuous learning piece is just mapping the output of here onto that particular head. And that's it. Whereas here, he's doing that, but there's actually, there's still a network here which has to learn. And but so this is a- layers, right? hmm? It's just two layers, right? It's just two layers anyway. It's just two layers, yeah. But there's still a uh, okay. you still have to you still have to solve something non-trivial here. It's a much harder task, I think. I see. Uh -huh. um, and it's more representative of what you might want a continuous learning system to actually do in, in practice. I see. Um, so in, in here, I would have been happier if he had had a couple of hidden layers in between here. There's no reason why they couldn't. Yeah, the, the reason they did is they wanted to keep the same number of parameters as the OML in order for, to have a fair comparison. And since they, they mimic and they have two networks which are the exact same size, they had to break it down in half. That's why they only have one FC there. Uh, yeah, but that that's, I don't know. I think that's kind of... But I see your point, yeah. Yeah, you know, then they, they could have done both. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how well this would work if um, they had two hidden layers in here. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess in some sense, in that case, this could have learned to do nothing. You know, maybe it could output all ones and you could end up with just this solution again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right, there's nothing. This is kind of a superset of the OML uh, solution mm -hmm. in its most generic, generic form. Okay, um, so there's gating that was done by the animal thing and in both OML and animal, they get really sparse activations. Um, so that, that's kind of nice. All right, then there was this other paper that just came out, I think just a month or two ago, um, the super mass and superposition. Um, is this slightly different? Uh, there's no meta learning here. In fact, the learning is super simple. Um, and so here, um, you, know, uh, you know, you have a standard case where you're outputting a probability over all the classes uh, given a set of weights and an input. So this is your, the output of your neural network and it's trained by cross entropy loss. So this is just the standard setup. And in continuous learning, you have a bunch of different L-way classification tasks. You have a bunch of things that you learn in sequence. Um, for a given set of inputs. So this is kind of the setup. So what is a super mask? Uh, super mask is simply the weights multiplied by a binary mask. Okay, so this is an element wise product. So this is very similar to how we do our sparsity in the sparse weights. Um, but the big difference they make here is that the weights are kept frozen. So they initialize the weights just like normal, about, almost like normal but then they never change the weights, okay? And the other thing is that the weights are either plus or minus C with equal probability, okay? So it's almost like a binary network. If you have plus C and minus C as your weights um, and they never change the weights at all. So the only thing they do is change the masks. Okay, so it's, so that means that if you think about your uh, doing continuous learning task one, 
you have a particular subset of the network that you use as your network for task one. Uh, that's what they call a super mask. And you have another mask for task two, another mask for task three, and so on. And all of these masks are kind of subsets of the same underlying highly connected network. Okay, so a super mask is a sparse subnetwork with essentially binary weights uh, that are never changed. <laughs> each super mask is specific to each task. Uh, and they make the point that this is really efficient to store. You don't need to store all of the weights. You just need to store the random seed that generated the weights. Um, and then you have to store each of these masks, which are binary. Okay, so the only thing now is, okay, how do you learn these super masks for each particular task? Um, this part actually was not clear to me in the paper. Um, there's a couple of different possibilities, but then they cite, they, they do cite a, a previous paper by them called What's Hidden in a Randomly Weighted Net Neural Network? And this is how they, they learn the mass there. So I'll, I'll describe this. I'm not 100% sure how they actually learn it in this paper. Um, but in their previous paper, what they do is um, they have for each edge, it's got a weight, but it's also got this score, SUV. And then in the forward pass, they only look at the top K percent, the weights with which have the top K percent of the scores. Okay. So they pick some subset of it, you know, uh, where it's determined by K what that, how large that subset is. But then in the backward pass, they update all the scores with a straight through estimator. So they, um, you know, update the, they update the scores only, not the weight values. So they update the score. So during the backward pass, this score, which was not in the top K percent, could suddenly become in the top K percent and this guy could now drop. So you can actually, you can change the connectivity dynamically um, uh, through learning. And to me, this is very analogous to what Marcus has uh, uh, showed last year as well, in terms of uh, learning sparsity uh, through the variational uh, techniques. Um, I don't know if it's exactly equal or not. Uh, Marcus, maybe you can, uh, you can opine on that, but uh, it's at least conceptually, it's, it's very similar. So you can think of this score as almost being like a permanence, except here he's taking the top K percent of the permanences instead of setting a threshold on the, on the permanences. I agree, they're very similar, uh, yeah. I, in this case, I, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't describe this as the variational stuff. No. It's, it's more just like, the, but, but the permanence idea and, and um, tuning it using back prop, yes, that's, it's, with the straight through estimator, it's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, he didn't say it's variational at all, and I'm not saying it's variational, but it's uh, uh, it's it's sort of very similar. Um, so Subutai on the backward pass, when they um, since they're updating all the scores, that means on the forward pass, they basically have to compute all the they basically have to treat it like it's a it's a dense network to do the forward pass, right? Because you need all the activations. Yeah, you need all the um, they need all the scores in the forward pass during training. Um, after training, they can just store the mask for each. Um, I, you know, once training is completely finished and now you're just doing inference and you don't care about the training anymore, at that point, they can just store the mask for each task. So when everything is kind of done, so if you know what the task ID is, which is the kind of the, the simplest of the continuous learning setups, then they can just instantiate the mask for that task and they go ahead and then compute the output as, as normal. Um, but they said that it, one interesting thing in this paper is they can also deal with the case where the task ID is not known. And then, so what they do in that case is um, the output is a weighted mix, they look consider a weighted mixture of all of the masks um, um, where this, uh, you have an alpha I, which is your mixture coefficient for, for each mask. And at inference time, they run a couple of steps of gradient descent. So I think this is like uniformly set in the beginning. And then they run a couple of steps of gradient descent to minimize the entropy of the output. Um, so they're trying to find basically a set of coefficients so that the output is very certain. So if you think about in the beginning, 
the output may be maybe like this on the left. Why is my laser pointer there? So it might be like this. And then after a couple of gradient steps, you change the mixture coefficient so that you pick a, a, a combination of these masks such that the output is as confident as possible. Um, so this is what you can do during inference. Uh, they also consider the case where the task ID is unknown during training. So here, what they're doing is um, if they'd run a couple of steps of this gradient and the network is still uncertain, then let's say you're training on a new example. Um, and even after doing this, your out network is still somewhat uncertain. You don't get low enough entropy. Then they just instantiate a new mass and train it on that task. Okay. Um, and so, so by doing that, they gradually create more and more masks uh, uh, based on this uncertainty metric. So here, uh, they were able to go to 2,500 classes in a row. Um, it's <laughs> super impressive. But they do they actually didn't do it on Omniglot. They did it on permuted MNIST, which I believe is a is a potentially a simpler task, I think. Um, but the impressive thing is that there's no task identity during training or inference in, in this chart. So they're able to handle a wider set of um, uh, categories. Um, or, or scenarios of continuous learning. And then even in this case where there's no identity during training or inference, they can go for 2,500 uh, categories in a row. Subhutai, do they have a policy for retiring masks? Uh, no. There's nothing, uh, at, at least I didn't see anything in there. Presumably what would happen is if some later masks make some previous ones obsolete, this alpha would always go become low for those early masks. You know, they could notice that, I guess, over training and that, that would be an optimization. They could see that if, well, afterwards, if some mask is never used, you don't, you know, you can just drop it from your set. Well, if they're using cross entropy here, uh, after the numbers get really high, isn't that kind of a, a very weak signal? If you have lots and lots and lots of these uh, the masks, and you're trying to see which one of them is dominates, so the, isn't that? Yeah. So, but they're trying to minimize the entropy here. So they're trying to get one guy with the highest probability. Right. So that's very informative. If they were to maximize the entropy, then every there would be the opposite. They would be all sort of equal. Okay. Yeah. So to define, define the mask, they're minimizing the, uh, they're trying to minimize the entropy of the output distribution, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that mat that matches the correct output distribution, right? It could be confident, but wrong. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, uh, that could be a problem, um, but it looks like they're <laughs> getting pretty good results on this, one, on this test. So this is pretty impressive uh, what they're able to do here. And that, and that plot, do you know what up means? Like uh, what that refers to? Um, I, I, I uh, cut this off. Uh, I know in the paper it says like upper bound or, or something. Um, but yeah, I think their upper bound is probably if you train uh, normally on all the classes in a typical setting, what is the maximum accuracy you could get? Oh, okay. So that would be the best th that this particular network could do, assuming, you know, full-on training, no continuous learning. I'm uh, assuming that's what that means. Okay. And I don't know why they have a lower bound, presumably is zero for everything, but lower bound might be a typical backprop train network in, in continuous. Okay, gotcha. And continuously, yeah. They don't show results for other models that didn't get a task label, right? It seems like, or at least in that plot. Um, no, because uh, there aren't that many situ. There aren't that many models around that can that can do that at all. Okay. Um. 
So that, that's why it's it's kind of impressive. Able to do. Uh, the, so the, finally, uh, yeah, the, go ahead. Do a model that called uh, batch E. It's on some of the other plots, uh, and I think the PSPF and the batch E are thing too. Or something. Uh, the, the batch E. There is like a yeah that one. That's yeah, so I think this is uh, this is during inference. Uh, whereas oh, this is okay. actually during training, they don't have ident task identity. Oh, I see. So they want that one. They don't have any. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So this is this is pretty cool. I, I like I like this idea. It's very simple. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, let me see. I should have read this paper in more detail, but. Um, yeah, I don't think they did anything with ImageNet or anything hard yet. I don't, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think so. So it's unclear, you know, without training the weights at all, you know, how well could you do on something like ImageNet? They did, uh, they did something like that here. This is the, the previous paper. Um, let's see. Yeah, they had ImageNet experiments here with... Uh, there's they had a table somewhere. Sorry, sorry for moving this around so much. Yeah, so I guess they get got to about seventy percent. Uh, here they can get to about 73% accuracy on a wide version of ResNet 50. So the two, the couple of interesting things here that they mentioned, this is the, the previous paper. Um, I like this chart here. Uh, what they show is that as you make the networks wider and wider and wider by doing these uh, sparse subsets, um, you can get closer and closer to the accuracy of the dense version of the model. And so this is again a case where kind of dimensionality matters. And here also the way they're doing it, you have many combinations that are possible with a wider network. Uh, so that was kind of nice. In their case, they they get best accuracies when the percentage of weights with their the K is about 50%, uh, which to me seems quite high. So the network is this, these marks mess are actually not that sparse. Anyway, um, we've seen another example of this uh, idea of learning masks uh, coming from the, the pig back paper uh, in the presentation that Shin gave last year. You yeah, remember? yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he, he showed very good results on, on transformers and NLP, just learning the mask. Yeah, was it similar? Did, did, did he, but I thought they learned the weights too, or no? No, they just learned the mask. So they got a pre trained network. Oh, and a pre-trained network. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. they fine-tune by just learning the mask. Right, so right. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I remember that, but those those weights were trained. They were um, pre-trained, yeah. They were trained. Here, there's nothing other than the random initialization. Right. But you, you so if, if you can get that with random initialization, if you can pre-train or even like meta-train with some of the algorithms we were seeing before, then you can get a lot further, right? I mean, theoretically. Theoretically, yeah, yeah. So I think this is a that's an interesting kind of next step with, with these with these ones. Um, but I I thought I'd just close with the same thing again. I, I thought there were a lot of connections to um, HM temporal memory. Um, you know, here as you're seeing with the supermass one, as well as the the neuromodulatory neuromodulatory network is. Uh, they, they instantiate very sparse, well, they instantiate subnetwork specific to each task. In the case of the supermaster, it's not very sparse, but in the case of animal, uh, it, it's at least the output is uh, that's sent to the classifier is very sparse. Um, in our case, uh, we have dendrites that are choosing which subnetworks to instantiate dynamically for any given input. Um, in the case of animal, they have this um, 
you know, element wise multiplication that's choosing uh, what to send out in the case of uh, supermass, uh, it's very dynamic and they use this kind of entropy measure to, to decide which ones to send out. Um, I think I think the dendrites option could be much more flexible and much more powerful here. Uh, and if we can get to extremely sparse subnetworks, I think that could be super powerful as well. Uh, in, in almost all of these cases, I think they have uh, sparse representations to avoid significant overlap. Um, and in the supermax case, it looks like the weights are close to binary. It's just two different values. Um, uh, they don't, and in their case, instead of permanences, they have this pop-up score, which chooses which weights to make active via learning. So I thought these were kind of interesting correlations uh, between the, I think they're sort of very much in the same spirit as what was in the HTMs, uh, but hopefully we can do things in a much more flexible way. Each of these seems still a very kind of rigid in some particular way. Um, and it's not fully satisfying yet. And hopefully uh, if, we, if we can incorporate a lot of these principles, we can get to something that's uh, really nice and flexible and, and powerful. So what, what is the weight sparse in the supermassive paper? Do you... uh, so 50%. 50. Uh, 50, I think, is what they find. So here's like the percentage of weights that are on. This is for right. ImageNet, uh, 50%, 50 to 30% is the sweet spot for them. But that that's from the other paper. So supermass is just using that Here. same idea and same. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, the training in the supermass paper was really confusing to me. It's, yeah, it was they confusing didn't, to me as well, right? They just, yeah, they they didn't really describe it well, in my opinion. Um, they just had a line in there that says the edge pop-up algorithm is used to obtain supermasks. So this paper here, 38, is, is this, this one. Uh, okay, I see. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but it says uh, layer-wise budget from 34. Which one is 34? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't look it up. Uh, 34 is. Mm. Oh, that's a that's a SET paper. That's the SET paper, yeah. So the budget yeah. is uh, thirty percent, right, for an SET, or even lower. It's, I think it's five percent, no. What does that mean, layer wise? But that's how much you change every iteration. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> if it's how much you change, it's thirty percent. If if it's how much of the weights are active, it's about five percent. So I don't know what they mean there. Isn't that yeah, like that so, uh, Erdos uh, Ramey topology or something like that? I, I forget exactly the name, but they had like mm -hmm. some way to to calculate the desired sparsity per layer based off of like the number of input features and output features or something yeah. like that. So I, I think if the sparsity was actually something close to 5%, they would have mentioned it um, because they make such a big deal in this previous paper that the optimal sparsity is around 30 to 70. Mm. Yeah. Optimal density is 30 to 70%. Yeah, uh, about, about um, the uh, Erdos Reini, the, the algorithm. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you say Erdos here in uh, America? I'm curious, sorry. <laughs> what I do lived, you say? Uh, I lived in Hungary for a while, so I think it's pronounced, no, it's Erdos, Erdos. Uh, Erdos, okay, we'll take care of that. Erdos Reini, the, the algorithm, they have like this parameter epsilon that defines how much parts do you have? So the algorithm doesn't define, it's just a way of calculating, like you said, based on the input output, but then you also modify to a parameter. And yeah, so yeah. it could be anything regardless of this algorithm. So, yeah. And I think in SAT, they said it in a way that it's about 5%. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. I, I feel like here, if it was that low, it, it would have mentioned it. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing it's just how much they change every well, how much is that change every iteration is is based on the backprop. So I don't know if they have a budget. So I, I've, I'm confused. I don't know what this layer wise budget is. Their code is available, so we could look through their code. Yeah, uh, I'm 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 curious how much sparsity they get to get. Is, is it yeah. not just that it's per, per layer? It's th this much sparsity, so that at least some layers aren't more um, sparse than others. Isn't it something like that? You mean trying to maintain a constant sparsity across all the layers? Yeah, I think so. I think I might have seen that in one of the one of the supermass papers. Yeah. Now, interestingly, they didn't look at their activation sparsity. They're just talking about weight sparsity. 
uh, whereas the other two, animal and OML, looked at activation sparsity. Yeah. But, and uh, so, but one drives the other, not necessarily. Not necessarily, yeah. I'm thinking out loud, yeah, not necessarily. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if they end up choosing masks such that the activation sparsity is also sparser. So for some of the super masks, um, they, they made the, uh, I guess they were only working in the regime where the, the weights are binary. But is there, was there a reason for that? Um, not like the really. weights are binary or the, or you said it was effectively binary, but was it just they're, a random? They're not, they're not yeah, random. it's either, random. it's either minus C or C uh, randomly. And, uh, oh, okay. I think the reason, uh, Karan, is that if you look at the original Supermass paper, uh, they started they, they started with random weight and they tried to make it simpler and simpler and simpler to see how far they could get by just learning the mass. And they got to the point that all you, uh, all you needed is was to set a constant and all that matter if they were positive or negative. So that was kind of the end of the Supermass paper, the original one. So I think they pick up mm -hmm. from there, uh, having that knowledge and they just define that based on that. Oh, that's that's how far that they got. And I think they mentioned that's actually inspired by um, Hattie's paper. Yeah, yeah um, I'm talking about Hattie's paper. The original Supermars paper is her paper. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. I'm talking about. Exactly, yeah. I can, uh, I can find the link here. I have it actually. I was just looking at it. Oh, okay, <laughs> I sent the blog post. You sent the paper. <laughs> oh yeah. Do you want to? Uh, do you want to share it or? Uh, uh yeah, I I can share. Oh, let let me see. So in supermass, I think they cited uh, two papers for the way they actually learned the supermass. So one was the uh, Ramanujan paper that um, Subita, I think you also talked about. That, that's the one that uses a straight through estimator, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, and then this one that, uh, that Michelangelo just sent, is this, is this the other method of? Yeah, so this was the original uh, Supermass uh, paper. Okay, got it. Um, yes, so, so just to give an over, overall view. So the idea here of this original Supermass paper was following the lot, lottery ticket paper. And what they were trying to show here is that uh, you didn't even have to reinitialize the weight. So in the lottery ticket, they learned the mask and they reinitialize the weight to the original value. And then they, they retrain from there. And what they're showing here is that you don't even have to reinitialize the weights. You just learn the masks. And if you reinitialize all the weights just to a constant value, that's the same uh, sign of the original weights. So if it was originally positive, it's a plus one. If it's originally negative, it's a minus one then you, you get the same results. So this was following the lottery ticket. So that's, that's at the end here, this mass. The large final same sign mass criteria. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just to go through the blog paper later, it's, uh, it's actually very interesting. Uh, Hattie actually presented to us here, the mentor. Yeah, yeah, that was in the Brains at Bay meetup uh, last year. Um, I think the one another nice thing uh, with this particular paper is they were actually able to get, you know, competitive or better than, you know, state of the art results on this really long uh, continuous learning task. Whereas I think some of the other ones, the results weren't quite state of the art, but they were getting close to, they were just doing better than, well, you know, a lot better than chance and better than what you might expect. Whereas here, I think. I don't think there's any technique so far that comes close to their 2,500 categories in a row. And, and the memory usage and speed is really fast. It's such a simple technique. Um, so they make a point of explaining how that they can do this really fast in PyTorch and on GPUs. Yeah, the, the random seed idea is, is genius because then you can have yeah. networks <laughs> as large as you want, right? And you can just instantiate at at during running time, you only need the only the running seed matters, so it's not you don't restrict the size of the network. So. Yeah, I guess you still have to have it fully instantiated in memory. Yeah, at runtime, uh, so it still has to fit in the memory of a GPU. 
Yeah. But still, uh, it, it's, it's ingenious for a continuous learning task. We're learning like thousands, let's say lifelong learning, or learning a million tasks, and you have to start that. It's mm -hmm. a very ingenious way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I keep wondering, you know, that, you know, what if you had networks that were so wide that they just couldn't fit in memory, but you only needed a really sparse subset of it. Um, you know, could you implement it in, in such a way that, that you could run that efficiently? Most of it is, can be ignored at any particular point in time. Yeah, that's what we are good at, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's our challenge. <laughs> Where's Kevin? Yeah. yeah.